Okay, only two options, darling. Stop, Bye. stop worrying about the options. <laughs> right. Um, uh, yeah, I'm going to back this up with a, with a, a, a short document that supports it. So we're basically covering uh, handling objections. The more I looked at this, the more I, I've resurrected it, the more I thought I probably ought to go over presentations first. However, um, maybe we'll do that on another occasion. And the set, there is another step we need to cover, and that's really closing and what closing means. Um, but I'm, I'll, I'll save that for a, another session. I'm not going to cover it today in detail. I'll, I'll be referencing it, obviously, because everything we do, even in relation to just pure objections, is leading us to a close. What's a close? It's a question. That's all it is. Mm. And it's having it's a question about making a step. Now, you can call that close an order. You can call it a meeting. You can call it whatever you like. It's an agreement to the next step. It's even a no, if you like. You're agreeing to their no for whatever reason that might be. And we'll cover that. We'll cover more about uh, objections in a second or two. Um, and, wh and whether actually they're, they're proper objections or not, because objections can be um, several things or two, two things, lots of things. I'll cover them in, in, uh, in more detail in a minute. Right. Uh, let me share my screen and we will go. So get your pen and paper handy. Hopefully you will. Uh, oh, sorry, no, bear with me a second while I start PowerPoint and then we can take it from there. Can you see that? Uh, yeah. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I, you see it? Before we go any further than this slide, I, I just want to pick up on the on the subhead here, which is people buy from people they trust. And so to be, you've got to effectively communicate that process during your presentation process. I'm also making a couple of other assumptions here. And that is that you're engaged in, in well, this, this process works even with people you know well, but it's even more important to understand the way it works with those you don't know well. Uh, because in other words, or indeed cold calling, because people are, especially nowadays, they're much more suspicious. Uh, I listened, I, was, I don't know whether you picked up on it, but I was listening just this morning to this report about the truck, the, uh, the track and trace program they've been building, the UK spending 30 billion on. Mm. Can you believe that? And one of the things that people was said on there is that people don't answer their phone and they don't recognize the phone number anymore because they're expecting it to be a scam. Mm. So we're increasingly running up against those kinds of problems. People are taking a much more defensive position. So one of the things we have to do before we even get to the objection process is expect the fact that they're likely to be in a not hostile, but a defensive position, especially if you're delivering, if you're phoning people and you're not delivering them your phone number. You know, it comes up as a private number. Because I, I don't know if you're like me, I tend not to answer private numbers because they can go to voicemail and leave me a message because I've got my voicemail on all the time. So if someone's not prepared to share their phone number with me, why would I be prepared to share my time with them? Mm. Um, so bear that thought in mind you know you've got to be open and honest here because people buy from people they trust and that's the process we're going through so when you always hear us talk about me in particular when you're talking to your your list the list you've built and the list you continue to build all the time you're in a position of strength because that person knows who you are even if it's only a passing uh, you know, you met them somewhere in a bar, in a bar, a bar or a coffee shop or a pub or whatever it happens to be. You know, you, they do know you in some way or another. And how you work that connection depends entirely on the level of trust they will have in you. So your list, the big advantage every network has, and one of the reasons why companies choose this way, excuse me, of doing business is because the people you know and know well, your core 
influence a group, um, they're people who know, like, and trust you. Everyone has a tribe of influence. It's around about 150 people is the core group that you know. Actually, it's much bigger than that overall. Um, the people that you are acquainted with, it's around 600. Um, this is being done through research by Andrew Dunbar, who created Dunbar's number over many years of social science research. And um, hang on, I'm just gonna admit, admit someone. Um, <coughs> and so those influencer groups, it's, it, you've got a core group of around 15 people you know extremely well. Those are the ones who are most intimately associated with you. So that's the base core that you have. They know, like, and trust you. They're the sort of people you, you share intimacy with in some way or another. So um, people buy from people who trust. So this is a thought to bear in mind all the time. If you are making phone calls and you're cold calling people, which I have done massive amounts of in my time. Uh, that's an interesting one. Okay, that's great, thanks. If you have done a lot of cold calling work, which I have uh, in my time, because my background, as many of you know, is I ran a telephone where I started the agency when there were just two of us, and we built it into a substantial business, which means that we made cold calls for a living. Can you hear me now? You hear me all right? Great, thank you. Okay, so moving on, the objectives of today are, qu are quite simple. And the objectives of this paper that I will share with everybody that backs this up is to identify what excuses and objections are a natural part of the sponsoring process. Because they're not, they're not things to be scared of. They are natural. It's just an ordinary part of, of the discovery process as part of your conversation with people. And those who don't have experience tend to shy away from dealing with these and give in really easily. When someone says, I haven't got any money or I can't afford it or it's too expensive, they back away from it. Now that's not necessarily the case. So what we're gonna cover is how we uncover what the, what the real reason is. Um, and I'm gonna cover it in a simple seven step process, which you, will, you, you can go away with. And again, it's on this paper I will share with you after the end of the, this conversation. So you're going to be able to teach that as well as use it. Now, if you adopt these techniques, and this, this technique in particular, I'm going to talk to you about today, then you can share that with your own people, because ultimately we're all looking for one key thing, and that's duplication of activity. You hear it said all the time, it's duplicate, duplicate, duplicate. It gets confused with the development of leaders. It's not, that's not the same thing. What we're looking for is a duplication of activity not a duplication of people. So this is an activity anyone can understand and undertake. So can you admit that? Yeah. yeah, great. And I'm going to explain how to overcome excuses and objections using feel, felt and found. It's a really simple way of doing this. We can complicate it and I can talk a lot more technical detail, get in there, but this is the simplest one to use and the one that builds empathy and rapport much more quickly um, than using other more complicated methods and or just talking, which is what we all get tempted to do. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the judicious use of silence, because actually it's probably the most scary thing people can, act, can learn how to use properly. But it is one of the most effective things because it essentially demands someone to fill the space. And the demand to fill the space is the winner is the one who doesn't not the one who does. <laughs> I'll come back to that again in a bit later. So these are the objectives of what I'm going to cover today. This is not soup to nuts selling. This is just about how you deal with people who come up, come up with what you perceive as an objection. Uh, an objection. So first of all, let's, uh, let me just move this slide on. Bear with me. Here we go. First thing is about preparation. Now it's really easy to pick the phone up and bluster your way and bumble your way. It's what we used to call the mumbling and bumbling stage. Um, because, you know, you're kind of making it up on the fly. You're, uh, you're not quite sure of your material. You're not really sure of what you're going to say to someone. And it doesn't flow naturally. The vast majority of people are in that group. So the best way to handle any kind of calling, whether it's someone you know extremely well, 
but you're coming at them from the perspective of a Zinzino partnership or a Zinzino product, the best thing you can do is plan your call. Be very, be prepared, understand your subject. What are you saying to them? I script it. I've scripted things all my life in terms of making calls. The reason's simple. I don't, it leaves nothing to chance. I know what I'm gonna say. I don't have to think, I just have to deliver it in the right way. So you're not, you're not creating anything on the, on the fly. That comes down the line when you've practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced. So you know it so well, it trips off the tongue with, that, with its second nature. Now you are actually still using your script. You're just delivering it because you practiced it well enough. It's just like a play at the end of the day. You know, you can't do Hamlet without learning the lines. Um, perhaps that's a bit ambitious, but you, <laughs> but, but you, you get my point. It's you got to know your you've got to know your stuff, but you don't want to know so much stuff you overwhelm people. And by way of an example here, um, <clears throat> some of you would have heard this before. But when Sue and I first well when when I first got exposed to this concept of uh, network marketing, multi level marketing, whatever way you like to call it, this business method that we use. <clears throat> it would have been 1980 something um, and a secretary, an ex-secretary of mine phoned me uh, after she'd left the company by three or four months, I suppose, gone to another job, which is fair enough. She, she'd, uh, she was time for her to move on from her point of view, not from mine in particular. But, um, and she phoned me uh, and, and, and said, look, I've, I've come across this, which is quite, quite disciplined initially when she made the call. And I remember it really well because of what we do now. Um, and she phoned and said, look, I've, got, I've come across this business. I'd really like your opinion about it. Uh, and I wondered if I could invite you to come to a, to a meeting. Brilliant. Got it done. And I, being the kind of person I am, wanted to know more straight away because that's what I do. Because I come at this from the perspective of someone who is trying to communicate a, a really a real message. So I said to her, well, what's it about? And she just opened the floodgates. Literally, I mean, I got fire hosed for, well, I don't know, three or four minutes. She'd lost me after about 15 seconds. She tried to explain the concept of network marketing, multi-level marketing over the phone to me. Now, for someone who'd never been in that kind of business and never understood it, never, never come across it before, in, all, you know, in the years of business, I'd, uh, I'd never come across it from anybody. And I, she, because she lost me after 15 seconds, that I just moved away from it instantly because I, I wasn't going to waste my time on something I didn't understand the basis of. So I said to her, look, it doesn't sound like something I'd really like to get involved in, actually. You know, I'm sorry, but it's not for me. Now, as luck would have it, not very long after, uh, Sue got approached by her very first boyfriend. Pause for a moment. Uh, and and, and uh, I wasn't quite sure about this, <laughs> I'm candid. Uh, however, she went, she being more open-minded than me, when she told me what it was, she said, ah, yeah, I know all about that. I got, I've forgotten the girl's name now. I remember the conversation, my ex-secretary, but I can't remember her name, which is a bit strange, but there you are. Um, and uh, I said, I know all about that. So-and-so told me about it when I, she called me and I hadn't bothered to share it with Sue anyway, because it just dismissed it. So Sue went off to this meeting I said, you go, you know, let me know what you think. So she off, she went to this meeting, came back and was so excited. I, I couldn't, she was excited. So I kind of got excited because of her excitement. And we eventually, I kept pumping her for information. I couldn't, she didn't know what she was talking about. She just got really, she was really enthused by the whole thing. So anyway, then I had to find out more and, and well, the rest, as they say, is history. So this is a kit. This is a salutary lesson. Hopefully you'll take it on. Do not become the fire hose holder. The more you tell on this in, on initial contacts, the more, the less actually people will understand. And very likely the more resistant they'll become, which is what happened to me. That was the side effect of that conversation. So first things, understand your subject. Know what you're gonna say, Put write the script. Second thing, but you must be an active listener. What do I mean by that? 
You can't tell the way someone takes in information unless you listen to what they're saying to you. Because selling is not telling, it's asking. It's asking the questions. You're finding out, you're going through a discovery process. You're finding out about them. So it's always a question leading to an answer. Questions can be closed or open. Closed questions demand a yes or a no. Now, technically speaking, you can arrive at the right conclusion just by asking yes, no questions. But there's no interaction and you don't really get a feel for the way these people are genuinely thinking. Open-ended questions, which we'll cover in a bit more detail, there are basically six of them, demand a response. They demand an evaluation. They demand an, uh, an impression and a feeling. And the more we understand about the way someone is responding to what we're asking, the easier it is to tailor what we say to them. Next point is tell the truth. You must always be honest about what you're doing here. So whenever I call up someone I know and I'm asking them about uh, uh, wanting to get them involved in the business, I'm asking them, I'd like their evaluation of, what, of, of, a, of the business. I think they'll really be, be really excited about and we can make some money alongside. Would you give me a little time? We can get together for a coffee when you're allowed to. Or I could run a through a presentation. Would you, would you do that? Yes, what's it about? Well, that's what the point of the presentation is, is to let you know what it's about and then to get your, your, your view on that. Would that be all right? Well, yeah, I guess so. Or no, not for me at the moment. I'm too busy. Whatever it happens to be, then we kick it down the line. But it's always about being honest of what you're, what you're after. So don't scam someone into coming around to, to, to look at what you do. Plan your presentation. It's a story. And the more people buy the stories, you know, it's uh, it, because it humanizes what you're, what you're doing. It's not left brain, it's right brain. And the connection then comes to the heart, which is the place where all the decisions are genuinely made. Craft your pitch and anticipate the objections and plan your answers. You see, if you do that in advance, then you can close the deal because you know what the questions are and how the, what the, the, the objections are they may be asking and what you can do in order to take it towards the proper conclusion. Doesn't matter what that conclusion is at this moment. You know the likely outcomes based on the questions that they're asking. So um, this, is, this is the point where I was thinking, well, perhaps I should get into presentations in, in a bit more detail, but we'll do that in another time because Zenzino actually has two really well-crafted presentations to communicate information about the product and about the business in a way which gives good understanding for people. They are, they are presentations, however, they're not conversations in the main. And that in, it, in itself then means you make a presentation, but you are actually leading to a conclusion about the next step when the conversations really happen. With something like the, the product, that, that can, be a, it can be a lot simpler, of course. With the business, it can very often be a bit more complicated in terms of dealing with the questions they may have. Uh, and I'm not going to cover the real detail of that today. So first things first, I'm taking the perspective of the cold call for now, because this is the hardest one to do. Correction, it's not the hardest. It's the one that needs the most attention in terms of the way you craft it. Now think about it like this. The person at the other end of the phone picks the phone up. They have no idea who you are. And you've got this idea you want to convey to them. So they don't know who you are, what you stand for, what your product is, what your reputation is, whether you're trustworthy, whether the product works, whether the business idea you're putting to them is legitimate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the point I was making earlier about when someone calls me, they don't deliver the number, or they call me out of the blue and start trying to pitch me on something, I'm naturally defensive. And so are you, whether you recognize it or not, you're naturally defensive. So the, the engagement in the very first 15 seconds is the point, actually the research says it's seven, but um, I've, I've always worked to, to the idea of you can't really go more than 10 to 15 seconds on your intro in order to get the agreement to the next step of that conversation. When someone picks the phone, when I pick the phone up and it's, I know it's a cold call instantly. I rarely get beyond 60, 15 seconds. In fact, I very rarely get beyond one, if I'm honest. 
<laughs> excuse me, um, <laughs> because I tend to prejudge what they're pitching me. Uh, so, but so this is the situation you're dealing with here. So we have to be open, and we have to be open about the way we present this. However, there's another thing that's quite important to understand here: how you do things, knowing the way you like to do this, because. The more comfortable you are with what you present, the better you will be at it. And there is, and when you are good at it, you enjoy it a lot more. When you're enjoying it a lot more, you know it's working for you because it, it's an energetic thing. All of these things are energetic ultimately. So knowing the way you communicate helps to understand the responses that people will give you based on what you say to them. So what do I, what do I mean by that? That's a, I can talk about that in a day from, from, on its own. So first of all is knowing your why. Why are you doing this? Because you've got to be very confident about this because you're always going, you're going to get the yes, the no, the what is it? The yes, the no, the what is it? Yes, the no, the what is it? The more you do it, the easier it gets to handle it. So understand your own why because this, especially in the early stages, will get you over the hurdles of perceived failure. No, no, let's just deal with that word for a second. It's not really failure. It's just a result. You can, you can interpret it as failure, but actually a no is as much of a success as a yes. You just get more no's than yeses because that's the way it works. And you have to have the no's in order to have the yeses. It's like the two sides of the coin. You can't have a, a head without a tail. You can't have a front without a back. You can't have an up without a down. They're just the same thing from a different angle different perspective. You just get more no's and you get yeses. That doesn't matter, it's just a result. And that's the way you have to treat it because it's not an emotional thing. We tend to interpret it that way because it's hard to get lots of no's because you're not making that step forward that you want to make. But that, and that's the point that a lot of people get put off is they, they get a few no's and they get no's from people they know well and that's painful because these people are saying no to them. You know, your best buddy turns around and says, I don't know why you'll get involved in that kind of game, Nigel. You, you know, no one ever makes any money out of that. Well, hang on a minute. That's not true. And you know that's not true, even though you may only have been in this business for a few minutes. That's just not the case. It's coming at this from a position of strong, perceptive ignorance. But it is ignorance. So you have to understand why you're doing it well enough to just ignore that kind of gratuitous comment, of which you will get many, trust me. Sue and I have had more no's in this world than many thousands of other people in lines of business that are totally different to ours. And the only reason for it is because we believe in the product, we believe in the mission, we believe in, the, in what we're doing. So know your why and, and keep it handy because when someone says no to you that you know well, your why will drive you through it. Well, that's because he doesn't, you know, in a way, I kind of look at that as um, I actually haven't done my job well enough because I haven't given him the reason to put his uh, his ignorance aside and take a look, you know, and that, again, comes with confidence and understanding and to some extent, a certain level of patience, especially with people who think they know better than everybody else, of which there are many. So keep, keep clear your why. Second thing, your posture. Be positive. This is, you must be unshakable. And your position is you are, you're sharing something with them that will have a place for them if they bother to listen. Third thing, what's your worth? How, do you, how worthy do you feel of the results that you get? Because, you know, people give up because they don't think that they deserve it. They might not think that on the face of it, but ultimately that very often is the case where they, they their self-image, their self-awareness, their self-belief, you know, it's just not there and it's hard work to work into it. That's, if, if, it, if it's shaky, buddy up. <coughs> Excuse me, buddy up with people who, um, who are upline, who are being successful, who, sh who energetically understand the way that this works because that worth comes across, your posture comes across, the strength of your why comes across, it all gets communicated. Whether you recognize it or not, subliminally people pick up on it. Um, and this is, part, this is part of the communication cycle and, uh, and how you express yourself and how you receive information may be different to the person you're talking with. So you have to encompass the different ways of doing that. And they are, they're essentially 
uh, these three. I've got, I don't know why I had auditory above. Must, anyway, what's your dominant communication channel? Is it auditory, kinesthetic, or visual? What are they? Auditory is obvious, it's ear. It's what you, you take in and you understand. Your primary mood, primary is sound. You know, that sounds good to me. You know, I, that just doesn't chime with me. You know, I've had a knock here and there. It's, it's words that express the way their communication works. Kinesthetics all about touch. I feel that, you know, it's, um, uh, uh, it's smooth and so on. Those sorts of words that, that, that express the way these people are being com communicating. Visuals, very obvious. The vast majority of people are visual. They take in information and when they can't see someone, that's, that's a handicap. It's one of the reasons people fear the phone is because they can't see the person on the other end. It's one of the reasons that Zoom has been, has exploded as a mechanism for making presentations and communicating with people in the last 12 months or so, because they're getting, the, they're getting some body language, albeit in 2D, not 3D. Um, uh, because that body language communicates as much, if not more, than the auditory sense. And of course, kinesthetically, um, that's, yeah, that's probably the third of the, of the most important ones. So when someone makes a phone call, they're actually handicapped by a minimum of 50%. That's why your words are so important. And what you communicate is so important. And you are aware that you can easily overwhelm people by too much information, doing what I have been doing to some extent, talking too quickly, because people don't process it fast enough. And by not processing it, you, they lose it, so they don't get the context of it. And for those of us who are visual, they don't visualize what you're trying to say. I mean, it's an interesting, interesting choice of words when people say, well, I see what you're saying. Because what they've done is they've conjured an image and we think in images. So we are always generating images out of what, you, what, what people are saying. And some years ago, there was a, uh, uh, some research done on this and it was concluded that only 7% of information is uh, actually in the content, the words, the rest of it's all through the visual and, and, and uh, the, the subliminal channels. So what's your dominant communication channel? Understand that for yourself. So, what, let's come on to the meat of this. Objections or conditions? And there is a difference. We're talking about objections today, but I need you to understand what a condition is. A condition is something, I should have put these the other way around, but the condition is something that makes the presentation irrelevant, like selling meat to a vegetarian. No means to pay or being able to get the means to pay. You know, in other words, they're just not in your market. Whatever way you look at it, their conditions are such that they're not going to become a customer or a partner. Don't waste your time. Now, in our case, of course, we can always sell vegan balance oil to a vegetarian. So in that mm. sense, that's meaningless. But the, you understand the difference between it. They're just not going to be in your market. And if they haven't got the means to buy, they're also not going to be in your market. But that you only get that if you ask the question. You can present all day long about the benefits and how marvelous it is and, and why they should buy it. But if they don't have the means to buy it, then they can't. Coming back to what's an objection, it's any question or statement that when handled correctly enables a closing question to then be answered. Do you get that? Any question or statement that when handled correctly enables a, a closing question to be answered. What's the close? It's asking them to, to buy, to agree to the next presentation, to meet for coffee, whatever it happens to be. Whatever the objective of your call is, that's the close that you're looking for. So let's get into some examples. Too much, products cost too much. Now I've taken the view here that um, where you're likely to get the most resistance is when you're recruiting partners. So a lot of these are to do with that process. I'm too busy. I don't think I'd be interested in something like that. You probably get it in that kind of energetic way as well. It'll become saturated. It's like doubling up on a chessboard. 
don't like to make money from my friends. I bet all of you've had that one. I know someone that didn't make it, a friend of mine down the road here, you know, he, he spent a fortune on X, Y, Z, and he still got most of it in his garage. Someone said it wouldn't work, and they didn't say who, they said a third party hand is, is gospel information. Sophia wants to be entered. Yeah, I've just got it. it. Okay. Don't like to sell. Common place. Lack of confidence. Not enough time. That's a big one too. Need some money now. Can't wait. They need a job. But bear in mind, that's not a no forever. It may not be a no now if you do explain it in the right way. Um, especially with the bonuses we could generate. It's just not for me. Well, that's a difficult one if if it really genuinely isn't, but you can ask for clarity. I'm too young, too old. Mind you, I did say that to Sue when we were in Barcelona, when Marco invited us out nearly two years ago now to come and look at Zinzino. And um, <laughs> I sat down with Sue in the, in the interval. We were both really excited about it because we'd listened to some, some great people within Marco's business, also Paul Clayton, uh, then we had dinner with Paul that night, Paul and Marco in a group that night. And um, the more we talked, the more excited we became about it. Because when we first really got into this business years ago, we got really excited about the possibilities of that one. Um, and this is knowing that lots of people, like everything else, if you don't give it the commitment that's needed, you, you simply won't do the work that's needed in order to get beyond the basics and move into that. Uh, that area of freedom, the territory of freedom, where the money starts to flow, the organization's beginning to grow. It's working well enough to start to provide you with residual income. You know, that takes time to get to. It's, it's the old Sisyphus thing of pushing the ball uphill, condemned for eternity to do the same thing. Well, in fact, in networking, yes, you are initially having to do that, to push the ball, to get the momentum behind it. But eventually you reach the crest of the hill and down the other side, it's it's not plain sailing or plain rolling, but it, it becomes a lot simpler to make it work. And um, anyway, coming back to the stories, I said to Sue, have you got the energy for this? Because, you know, we are both technically retired, you know, and I know I know others on this call are as well. But do you have the do you have the energy? Because. I think it's all about choice, isn't it? At the end of the day, you're not too young or too old for anything. Ultimately, it's all a question whether you decide to make it make it work. And by doing that, putting in the work to make it work, you lose your friends. Well, that's complete nonsense if you do that in the right way. And we can we can cover that in detail already in another MLM. Mm, happy days. Because uh, especially at the moment, um, Zinzino is building credibility and momentum in a way that very, very few, in fact, I don't think of it, there is, I don't think there's another company that's doing it uh, like Zinzino is right now, uh, where it's, where the business model is based on such a unique proposition that there isn't any, there is not, there aren't any competitors out there uh, that I know of. Uh, and I'm happy to, to be corrected, but you'd have to prove to me that they are a genuine competitor. And the reason why I say that is because, as you probably gather, Sue and I have been in this industry for a very, very long time. Um, in fact, longer than quite a lot of people who are part of our group have been in the, on the planet. Having said that, uh, that, that, you can look at that in two ways. You can say we're jaundiced and cynical, uh, or uh, we've seen it all, therefore it's much easier for us to evaluate. And I like to think of it in those terms, rather than it being uh, the Jordan's and cynical other <laughs> elements of it, of course. Uh, and um, uh, we made we made it a choice to become involved because of those unique things about Zinzino that no one else has got, and, and I and I simply don't see that they are uh, that there is anyone out there like that. So if they're in another MLM and they're happy to talk about that, then I would suggest it's worth continuing because they're interested in what you do um very i mean but also you also have to remember that uh, they are part of their tribe because one of the things that all networks do is they build that group synergy that keeps people in the system and a lot of companies keep them in really uh, uh 
essentially by being their own best customers and the groups are somewhat secondary to them having other partners rather than Zinzino's model, which is all about the number of customers that we have and the partners are th therefore we're creating those customers. So we know the product works because there isn't another company that again, that I know of that has the ratio of partners to customers that Zinzino has. It's unique in my experience. Um, I'm going about that all day. Is it pyramid selling? Well, the similar answer to that is no. Um, but the way I deal with it generally is to is to say, well, what do you know? What do you understand by pyramid selling? Because then you can get into a technical explanation. You really want to. I used to get really hot under the collar about this because you know the simple fact is in the UK, if you do it really well, you go to jail for nine years. We've been in this business for 30 years and quite had the police knocking on the door yet. So the answer is no. Seven steps, seven very simple steps, which actually are really a circle. They're a loop and you go on around the loop until you exhaust it. And I'm going to cover each in a little bit of detail so that you get the message. You'll also get the, the backup document I'm going to send you, which has more examples in it. Um, and, but I'm, and I'm going to keep them relatively straightforward because I don't want to, I can over, I can overwhelm whelm you with too much information here. How are we doing? Yeah, we're doing all right. So firstly, it's about listening. I know it's hackneyed, but you've got two of these and one of these, and that's the order in which you should use them. Twice as much listening as you are talking. Because again, uh, you can you run the risk of overwhelming. Like my very first exposure to networking as a, as a concept was overexposure to too much information that wasn't well enough organized for me to understand it. So it's very, very easy to lose people. One of the reasons I use slides is because it keeps me on track. It also helps, hopefully, you get the points that I'm trying to make. Whereas if I don't have them, what I tend to do is go off down interesting tangents. And that's fun. It's certainly fun for me, but it's not necessarily particularly informative for you or to use a visual uh, term here, painting the right picture for you. You're not getting the full picture here. You, you're getting little bits of it and they're not, they're not coordinated. First things first, listen. Secondly, you must acknowledge what they say and empathize with that. Now we're communicating. You're expressing the fact that you understand what they're talking about and you're seeing it from their position visually. You're, you, you know, you get the feeling for what they're kinesthetically, what they're getting to. And you're discovering the real question through questions and answers, which we'll come to in more detail. So we want to respond to that, of course, because if this is a real or even a perceived objection on their part, doesn't matter. We're actually answering that. And the more we're talking, the better the relationship becomes. The more strength there is in it the greater the rapport there is in it. And therefore the levels of trust begin to rise. And remember what um, I was saying right at the beginning, people buy from people they trust. On that note, you may like to get a copy of a book by um, Stephen Covey called The Speed of Trust. It's quite big. Well, I say quite big. It's a paperback, you know, it's three, two or 300 pages long. Um, and it is an absolutely brilliant expose of how important trust is in organizations and the role that it plays in decision making and in expectation. I did a presentation on this some months back when we could present um, uh, at Heathrow, about over a year now, I think it was, um, because it's an, for me, it's a really important part of this process that we're talking about here. And trust comes from two things, information that people understand, feeling comfortable. In other words, they are, they've got a feeling that it's okay, it's, it's good. They move towards it, therefore, that it can be validated. Don't make outrageous claims because you can't validate them. So that sows the seed of doubt when you do. So again, this is about being truthful and honest. So being... Uh, communicating the right information in a way which takes people from one point of understanding to another. See, the whole world of advertising is built on one premise, 
and that is helping people to change minds. And you know what they did, the way that works is through what's through, called spaced repetition. You know, you see an advert on TV and you wonder why it keeps getting repeated. Well, repetition, 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 repetition raises the awareness because it's been repeated, but it also drives curiosity and the potential for activity because the communication is such that it's suggesting there should be some action there. You know, if you're exposed multiple times, you can take an example. Um, every, every Christmas in the UK, John Lewis does, spends probably two or three million pounds on one advert. And it is essentially a story telling the story of what John Lewis delivers in the Christmas experience. And they are always brilliant. They win awards every single year. And that's repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated throughout the run up to Christmas. Why? You're raising, they're, raising the, they're raising the bar for themselves in terms of people's thinking about buying from John Lewis. That's what the goal is. And that's what we do within what we, are, what we do when we're working like this. Because you very, very rarely get someone going, I'll have that instantaneously. It's always a process. It's not an event. Ultimately, it leads to an event, of course, because they'll make the decision. So during it, you've got to expect all of these questions to come from anybody who is discerning. So the fifth thing is to confirm it. You're confirming what you've, what you've talked through, cleared up their objection if they have had one, and we'll see what they can be in a minute. We're confirming that. We're repeating the process as necessary, because if there are other things that need to get dealt with, then we go back through the cycle again. And the ultimate goal is to gain a commitment. That can be to buy the product. It could be to become a partner. It could be to the next meeting. It could be to all sorts of, you come to an event, it could be all sorts of different things. But you know what, pardon me, you know what that is? Because you set that as the goal when you began your conversation. That was the purpose of the goal, of the, of the call. So this process is really straightforward, very simple, but it needs a little explanation in each arena. So let's talk about listening for a second. This is probably the most important skill of all to building rapport and understanding. Because you can't respond properly if all you're doing is telling, because you know, telling isn't selling, it's asking, always. It's asking questions because you're fitting what you're saying to meet their need. Because ultimately people buy things to satisfy a need. It may be a perceived need because, well, let's take an example. Uh, our son-in-law has almost an entire room full of trainers. <laughs> and so does, um, his son, because uh, my daughter's on a second there, you know, the second marriages. And I've never seen it like it, you know, anything like it. If I've had more than five trainers in my entire, five pairs of trainers in my entire life, I'd be surprised actually, probably more than that. But he, <laughs> he, he wheels two or three out, two or three different pairs out a day. But that's because it's one of those things that he really likes. He, he knows a huge amount about and uh, so much so his son, his son Kai deals in them, you know, so it's become a business for him. But my point is there's no, there isn't a need there that's obvious in terms of covering his feet as a need because it does something for the way he makes him feel. You know, designer labels are about feeling and the way they represent someone's personality. They're not necessarily about need. You know, once you're closed, you don't, you don't need more clothes, do you? Um, you know, you, as long as you can keep clean and, and covered, then that's fine. But of course, that's not the way clothes are largely sold. if They're sold on fashion statement. So thing is, don't interrupt people when they're talking, because the more they talk, the better you understand them, because you can interpret the way they communicate. Are they auditory? Are they visual? Are they kinesthetic? Don't make assumptions. It's the death knell, unless you confirm. So if I, if, I'm, if, I say, if I say this, would that be right? You're confirming. And you can actually be, I'm getting a bit too, too, 
too detailed perhaps, but you can be contrary just to prompt a further comment. So you can deliberately misunderstand something in other words and try and confirm that, but, and then say, is that right? Oh, no, 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 what I meant is this. And now you're getting more information. So it's a simple technique to get more information. People expect to be heard, remember, it's more about them than it is about you. It is always about them because we're trying to satisfy a perceived need they may not know they have, especially when it comes to balance and balance oil. You know, people don't understand. They understand omega-3. They understand they should supplement, but they don't understand why they should use our product because it's not really an omega-3 product. It's a balance oil. So it's all about balance and testing. So it's a different thing to buying an omega-3 supplement, which they think they should have because it's an essential fatty acid. So second thing, acknowledge and empathize. Reflect back what they say and clarify with questions. As I've just said, the questions are the most important thing. So what you mean is, let me get this right. The more you add, the better it becomes because there's more communication going on. You're not, you're not, you're not going for the throat, if you like, straight away, because it very often doesn't work. Follow their responses with acknowledgement to confirm and express your understanding. Now you're repeating back again. You're always reflecting what they're saying. Reflecting it puts it back to them. If it's wrong, they'll clarify. That's the process of communication. It's also part of the process of building rapport and, and, and empathy and ultimately trust. Discover the real question, because sometimes they're hidden, hidden objections. And you do that by using open-ended questions. And these are the six. Who, when, where, what, how, and why. Why is always a bit more, can be a little touchy. Um, you know, because you're asking, you're asking potentially emotional or emotive to get an emotive answer. However, it would be obvious if you're in a good enough relationship with them to be able to answer, ask that, use that one. So when would you do that? Uh, where would you like to be with that? What, you know, what, what's your why? That's a question you'd ask a new partner. Why are you doing this? Let's talk about your why. What do you want to get out of it? Let's, let's go through into that in detail. Let's set some goals on it. You know, I mean, all of that is about building that relationship. So the response, using feel, felt, found. This is the simplest way to begin the counter process for an objection. Always acknowledge how they feel, because ultimately it's about, the decisions are always taken in the heart. Ultimately, it's not about this, as I said earlier. There is, there's an evaluation going on consciously, but it's actually about the way they ultimately feel that will determine whether it will work. When you look at the, the people who have bought from you, it's about how they're going to feel that's ultimately prompted them to buy. Those who join us as partners have a goal for themselves somewhere. It's there's a why. And that's about their feeling again. Um, and and what, what they're going to move towards by taking action. So that we're then moving through empathy with felt. And that creates a sense of understanding and trust. So we're di disclosing that with what we found. So an example with this, let's take, I don't have time. Yeah, I know how you feel. I felt exactly the same way, but what I found was I could work part-time and that was all the time I needed to make a difference. Oh, part-time, what do you mean? Well, and then you got in a conversation again, haven't you? Around five to, five to 10 hours. Have you got five to 10 hours a week? Okay, so would you, now we're in a conversation about the five to 10 hours a week. They've just made a commitment towards it. So you could find five to 10 hours a week, could you? Confirm it. It becomes a conversation, but actually you're dealing with that, I haven't got time, objection by exposing the way that they can have time. But you can only do that if you, if you make it about the way they feel about it. So could you find the time? Most people could find five to 10 hours. Well, I'm not asking you to give up your job. Alternatively, you could say, hey, Jane, yeah, you know, I know how you feel. Time is really valuable, isn't it? I felt that finding the time to do this was gonna be a problem for me too. What I found, to my surprise though, was with some small changes in the way I use my time, I could make it work because the business is so flexible. Could you find seven to 10 hours a week for the right reasons? 
Who couldn't ask that? Sorry, I wasn't actually asking for a response. I was being, you know, I was just using that silence for a minute because I want you to think about how simple that is to, to say. And because of its simplicity, it's going to get answers. Because when someone says, yeah, I could find seven to 10 hours a week. So what would be the reasons to do that? You know, what, what's missing out of your life you'd like to have? What open question? What leads to an evaluated answer, an evaluated answer? Leads to an expression of feeling, because that's what we're doing here. Subliminally, we've shown that seed with this statement, quote, correction, with this question. It's embedded in it. I know how you feel. Time is really valuable, isn't it? I felt that finding the time to do this was going to be a problem for me too. Connections. What I found, to my surprise though, was that with some small changes in the way I used my time, I can make it work because the business is so flexible. Could you find seven to 10 hours a week for the right reasons? Do you need to give anything up or are you just rejigging the way you lead your time? Have you, you spend your time? This is a really, really powerful way of just dealing with those throwaway objections that aren't really. And you will begin to uncover what's going on underneath. And the more you ask and the longer your conversation, the easier it gets because you get more and more response out of people. This is the hidden use of it. I can't to the same thing. I can't sell. Or in this case, I can't sell. Understand exactly where you're coming from. That was my first reaction as well. That soon went away once I understood that all I had to do was affect an introduction using the simple system we have and the hands on support of my group. If I can do this, anyone can. See? It's all embedded in there, the feel, the felt, the found. Just describing the way I responded, what I found out, what I felt about it and what I found out. And if I can do this, anyone can. And then we tack another question on the end of it. Could you find seven to 10 hours a week? So these are relatively simple ways of continuing the conversation rather than accepting what appears to be a really a real objection. It's an objection, yes, but it's not a condition. Remember what we meant by condition. Conditions are circumstances where you're talking to the wrong person. They simply don't have the means to pay or they're in the wrong marketplace for whatever reason that happens to be. Um, and you uncover that by, actually, by again, asking questions. Seven, confirm, sorry, confirming. Confirm your prospect understands what you have disclosed. Because if they don't and they're confused, then generally what happens is people don't move towards what you're asking them to do because there's doubt, there's still doubt. So we're uncovering the doubt. Does that make it clearer for you now? Can you understand where I'm coming from with that? Simple things like that. Questions that would suit you in terms of the way you would do things. Repeat this process. So do you have any other questions or is there anything else you'd like answered before we go ahead and complete the paperwork or before we go ahead and arrange the time to get together? Re repeat the steps as necessary. Again, straightforward stuff. Always moving towards that close. Remember, objections lead to the close. That's what they're doing, the closing question. And last is gaining the commitment. It's confirming that commitment. Always, 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 always agree the next step. Never shut the door on someone. Even if they're adamant about, you know, it's not, you know, it's not for me, mate. No, no, I don't want to do that. But I mean, can't make any money in that. Blah, 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 blah. That's ignorance coming out, but that's fine. Plenty of occasions. Sue and I, th I think, um, probably the best example of this is when we, we approached some friends of ours when we first got into our first proper network and then uh, three and a bit years later, uh, I gave up my job because Sue's business had grown so, so big, it, it was big enough to support us both more so than mine was. Yeah. Uh, in fact, so much so her part-time income had overtaken my full-time income. And 
uh, we went to the States over the Christmas of 97, <laughs> came home, uh, went back to work. Um, my business partner had made some unbelievably stupid decisions while I was away. Only three weeks, so I can't believe he, excuse me, messed it up so badly in uh, three weeks, but he did. <coughs> and um, I made a decision there and then to get out. It took me six months to dig us out of the hole and get me out of that business. But um, ultimately I got out and we never really looked back. Sue and I went to work together. So that was mid 98, I think it was. And we've been working a, a networking business together ever since. So this business works. Um, and to close the, the circle on this, some friends we'd approached really early on uh, when we moved house and we bought a much, much bigger house, we moved house, uh, settled in and uh, I came around and said, oh, we think we'd better sign up. And that was probably five or six years after we'd first approached them. Anyway, there we are. So rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. It's the same process every single time. So let's recap. Listening, acknowledge and empathize, discover the real question, respond appropriately, confirm everything all the way along the line. That's, a, that's the thread that takes you to closer and closer and closer to the right thing. Repeat the process in order to be able to do that and gain that commitment. Never shut the door, ever. This really is a numbers game and be prepared to do the work because by doing the work, you get the results. It's only a question of doing enough work to get the results you want. And when in doubt, always go back to your why because that's the bit that gets you through the trip, that gets you over the hurdles, which we all come up with. You know, there's nothing more frustrating actually than doing it and 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 thinking this isn't working. Well, it is. It's just not working at the pace you'd like it to. And that's a personal frustration. It's not the reality. It just means that as long as you keep going, you will eventually get there because that's what happens. Um, and some people say this is a, a sold as a get rich quick business. It's it isn't. It isn't is the answer to that. I think we see a lot of people standing on stage who are doing very well and making good money at it. And some people manage to do that very quickly for whatever reason, especially those who come from another network that have an existing business or have been in this industry for a long time and have good connections and worked them for a long time. They can come in and bring in a lot of people quite quickly, but that's, be that's based on their influence. And that's not always the case in us, in ours it isn't, it hasn't been. Um, you know, we came in and we, we've, not pro we've not progressed as fast as we'd like. I don't think anybody ever does, even those who make it quickly don't ever see it as fast. But when you look at look at real life and you look at what's available in a networking business and the speed at which it genuinely can take you into financial freedom, three to five years would be the average, I would say. Well, it takes you four years to do uh, the degrees to get to be a doctor. It then takes two years as a junior doctor. You don't fully qualify for six years or thereabouts. And then you're on pretty small money. And the learning that has to go on in that time is phenomenal. And barristers are even worse. You know, seven years to get yourself to the bar and you're a pupil, your pupillage could last three or four years. And then you become a self-employed member of a very, very small group of people relative, certainly in the, relatively, certainly in the UK, only about 9,000 of them. And the vast majority of them who are doing criminal work aren't being paid enough um, to uh, have a decent standard of living. So, you know, you can't, you can't look at networking and say, oh, that's a get rich quick scheme. Well, you can, you can look at this and say, that's a, that's a get rich scheme. And it's a financial freedom scheme because ultimately the way the numbers work is very simple. You want to stop sharing your screen now because you've, yeah. you've finished that one, haven't you? Yeah. And then you can see people. There you go. Um, if you go to gallery, now I'm having a teaching on how to do Zoom, right? And, you know, as I was wrapping all this up. Right. Then I'm going to hand it to Sue. There we are. Hey, there's everyone there then. So all I'm really saying, just to wrap you this... You can unmute themselves too. Yeah, you can unmute now if you want. Just to wrap this up is, um, if you handle your calls correctly, 
and you do this again and again and again and again, you get to a proper conclusion. And ultimately what happens is you get a lot more yeses because you've uncovered the things that really matter to them. And more importantly, you've been able to deal with them in a way which sees them, sees them feel comfortable enough to move towards what you're doing. And the trust lo level goes up. Most people give up too far too fast. Uh, give up far too fast on the conversation and accepting an, ex a, 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 an objection as the reality when we're not really asking the questions. So listen, I hope that's helped. I hope it helps. I'm very, very, I'm very happy to answer any questions if people have got them. Um, I've got one. And I will, uh, uh, I will fire off this paper to everybody who's been on the call today um, so that you've got something to help you out. And I will run another, I'll run another, I'll run, I'm currently rewriting the whole of my manual, um, which is taking a little time. I'll do one on presentations shortly, and I will do one on, on closing as well, because those, the, the key areas of all, of all selling, if you like, is in those things. It's like presenting well, handling objections, doing the close, um, and, uh, and dealing with that on an ongoing basis. Um, my, Nigel, can I ask you a question, please? Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, Caroline. Um, we've not spoken before. Uh, I've spoken with Sue. So hello and uh, thank you for that. That's all really interesting and um, informative stuff that you've gone through. Um, but what I feel I would like a bit of help with, I've been doing quite a bit of cold calling recently mm -hmm. uh, and I have had a bit of success with that, if I'm honest. But um, how would you, um, what would you say on a completely cold call with somebody like um, a gym owner or a PT or a yoga person, how would you, what would you say to them on that first seven seconds? Oh, well, I was, I was just going to invite <coughs> Sue to do, Sue to comment on that because she's, she's yep. been doing You've a lot more. You've got my scripts. You've got yeah. my scripts. Yeah, I have. Is that what you would say? Sue? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have been. Yeah, I'll share it with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's it not. You. It's not a secret at all. Yeah. No, I don't know. Whether you would take taper it um, to a slightly different wording with um, health professionals or not health, but gym owners and people like that. In, so it's the same thing. <clears throat> in in this in the um, in the sheet I sent over to you, it did have about um, uh, fitness professionals as well. So it's, it is in there somewhere. So yeah, health professionals and fitness professionals, you just got to really kind of big them up because they, they're the experts or most of them think yeah. they're the experts. Um, but it's, uh, it, and yet we know that they are probably some of the worst contenders for having the worst results. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, um, you know, kind of, a, it's, it's calling, yeah, are, they, are they up to take the challenge? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, I mean, I mean, Stuart is probably better at answering this than, have, you know, you've, you've done some great, <laughs> you've done some great, you've got some great customers and, you know, great people with, um, uh, you know, fitness professionals as well. Yeah, I, I, I try and just be really honest with them. I'm comfortable in the, in the football background and I can chat to them really easily. Um, and then I let, I let the PDFs do the talking, to be honest with you. I really do. I just asked them if you know to share some information, uh, just on the scientific part, and just send you two or three PDFs for you. You can have a look at the science and what's, it, what's the product about. And maybe I'll pick up a conversation with you in a week's time because I know for their background in a professional environment that they're in, it, you've also got the business of their day and they're doing multiple things anyway. So for them to get find that space to be able to sit down and really look at something and absorb it and then come back to me. You know, I'm, I'm in the conversation now with three Premier League football clubs. Um, but again, that's been going on now for probably 10 days. But I've nudged them after a week for replying and said, just bear with us, you know. And the Man City thing, even Man City took probably about three, four weeks to develop that because they are extremely busy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, just asked about which PDFs do you send? Are you just product PDFs, I presume? 
Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah obviously, depending on what level of club, um, the Premier League usually will do their own testing, so the test isn't relevant. So it literally will be just the, on the balance oil, on the oils, really, the three oils, the balance, uh, normal, uh, the vegan, and the Aquarex. I'll just share them three. Just coming back to the, the original question, when you are opening a conversation with, a, with anybody in a professional environment like that, the last thing you want to do is start talking about detail. What you, what you want to do first is communicate some information with them because you want to discuss that information later. So the initial goal for the conversation is not to start yabbering on about what balance oil is or anything like that. It's all about test-based nutrition and, and Sue's Sue and I use a very similar script. In fact, I wrote it for the members of the group that share with us every day on, the, on this open call, which is, and in fact, you have, Carolyn, I think. Um, yeah. Because, you know, yeah. I'm working with a 15, now 16-year-old Swedish company, um, pioneering test-based nutrition here in the, in the UK. And firstly, what I'd really like to do is to send you some information about that to see if that might have a place in your, in your practice. That's it. That is pretty much it. Now, if they come back and tell, tell me more, then I'm, I'm just going to loop it back and say, well, look, let me send you that information. And we can have a conversation in 48 hours, whenever, when it's convenient, and then I'll book an appointment with them. And we have another conversation. And I'll translate that then into the goal to have a, a full presentation on the product through a Zoom conversation. Um, and that, in turn, then keeps it, that process is always the same. Because the more you vary the process, the more you don't know what works. Because we know this process works. So keep it the same. You know, uh, uh, otherwise, how can you know what you, what, how can you measure what you're achieving? You, you can, you, if you get, you get 10 no's, then why have you had the no's if, you're, if your approach is always different? The approach should always be the same. The first thing you want them to do is to evaluate some information which might be relevant to them, will definitely be relevant to you. Well, why do you say that? That's the only time I would respond when I say, well, what's that information about? It's about test-based nutritional results. And we know from more than 600,000 tests that pretty much everybody needs it, and I'd like to explain why. So can I send that information to you? What's your email address? That's it. I'm always going to loop it back to the email. Get the information out and, and agree once they give me the email address when I'm going to speak to them again. And that's, that's the key thing here. Because if they say, oh, well, I'll call you when I receive that, I don't send it. Because I'm not going to wait on them trying to get hold of me. And the reason, and where I work my way around that is to say, look, I'm on the phone most of the time. With respect, you know, if, if your diary's not, if you're not got a slot in your diary, there's not much point in me sending this information because I know that what will happen is it'll end up in a black hole. <laughs> So let's book a firm appointment now, because that way around, you and I both know we're going to be talking about the same thing. If it's of no interest for, to, to you, I don't want to waste your time. And, you're, and you know, and I, and I certainly don't want to waste my own. So, so we, we can agree in advance of that. If you look at the information before, before our appointment, and it's definitely not for you, let me know, because I won't be coming. That's part of what I mean about posture. You know, this is a business. We're in business as well as you are. And this is actually going to help your business. That's the whole purpose of it. Make sense? Yep. Yeah. Have you got that written down, Nigel? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll get it over to you. Yeah, I have. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't, you see, you can, you can, uh, you can anticipate all kinds of different answers and ways of dealing with it. I tend to deal with it that way because, uh, you know, I've got it here already. So for me, for me, it's 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 not a conditional thing particularly. Uh, and I've hardened up over years. I used to give away loads and loads and loads and loads and loads and expect people to come back to me. And you just don't. Um, and and when you're making lots and lots and lots of calls, you need to be careful with your time. Because you can get the time, you really can genuinely get through the rest of it. Yeah. Um, and so it's definite, definiteness of purpose that's is important. Because also that's a result in itself. See, that's the first hurdle. Someone saying, well, send, send me the information, I'll get back to you. 
that's a failure in my, that's, pardon me, but that's, I interpret that as failure on my part because at that mm. stage, because actually they have no idea what they're rejecting. <sighs> and that's my fault, that's my fault for not communicating that correctly. So now I'm saying, now I'm saying to them, look, let's just, let's just be businesslike about this. It's the point of doing it this way. Let's be businesslike about this. If you're, implement, if you're interested in the information I've got, then we need to have a conversation. If you're not, then that's fine, tell me. Um, so what is it you're not interested in about the test base? And now I get back into handling objection. Because essentially they're handling, it's an objection to me sending them the, the information. I want to overcome that objection, get them to accept the information and then agree to the, to the, um, uh, the appointment. That's the goal. Is the appointment the next appointment? It's to get them the information and have the that second conversation. It's not to sell them product. It's not to turn them into a partner. It's simply to get to the next step in the process. Uh, and if you follow that step, 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 then you, you'll get much more success than expecting people to, you know, to, to buy it on the basis of a conversation you've had with them that you're hoping is going to take them to a to a close. Mm -hmm. Be, if you're organized in this way, you'll make it, you'll do a lot better. Everybody will. Because you're more, you know, you're, you're better organized. You, you become more professional at it. Yeah, superb, Nige. Mm. Mm. Good for me. Good. Brilliant, Nige. Thank you. Oh, we don't, yeah. we've, we've, not, we've not done too badly. I thought it would be about a, an hour and a half. So we were an hour and 15 so far. Yeah. Okay, Nigel, can I just, just mention one thing on you, something you said that I do that, you don't yes I, I mean i know that's an odd thing to say it was when you said uh the one of the objections and um, your person you're talking to says i can't sell i have i personally have always said neither can i i've always agreed with them because i can't and i still really don't realize you're very good at it do. pardon you're very good at it I'm not <laughs> selling, selling it. You're not. You're not selling it. Extremely successful. <laughs> but I just, I just wanted to put that in that when someone yeah. says that to me, I say, well, no, I don't, yeah. because I don't consider that I am selling. It doesn't yeah. feel like I'm selling. And also, the word I would put going back when you were talking about the objectives, I'm really curious when I ring people up. I genuinely want to know about them, what they do, what they're thinking, why they do this, why they don't whack, but why, why, I, I loved your bit about telling everybody, you know, the why, what, where, just ask questions. You don't really need to tell them anything yeah. because I don't really, I actually don't know all the answers. In fact, I hardly know any of them. And then I'd like someone else to do it or know where to send them to because I, I don't know what the oils yeah. I mean, what you've just said Liz, is, <laughs> is so true because if you you know if you just go in it as you know kind of business and just go well you know kind of um hello mrs brown you know kind of i'm 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 calling from a, you know this and this and blah, 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 and all the, do the script and everything if you don't make friends with them if you don't start a, a, a relationship with them then expect them to have quite a closed mind but it's just that I've got, you know, I always go to the, say to them, how have you been coping with, you know, have you been able to manage with the, with COVID? You know, have you been open? If they're talking practitioners, how are you, how have you been managing? Have you resorted to going online like so many others I know have? Oh, yes, I have. You know, I've done that, but I'm not very good at it or whatever. I had one lady who said, I haven't done anything since, since we had the first lockdown. Mm. You know, that's tragic. That's tragic. Yeah, yeah, I think so. <clears throat> I just wanted to, to mention that. Because that's great. You, you're absolutely right. Yeah. It's all about listening at the end of the day and asking the right yeah. questions. You're getting, mm. you're getting them to talk to you. It's, mm. it's just about... I, 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 but hearing what they're saying, don't have your answer ready while they're still talking because you might miss something really important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, true. Mm. But if you, you've, just, you've just got to learn a few few key objections and mm. I think of you know because we're all kind of well you know we've all had the oh my god that's a that's a pyramid selling and people have actually been saying to me you know oh, is, is that multi-level marketing and I go no it's e-commerce actually oh that's fine 
well, you can always say, what's multi-level marketing? Well, that's what I usually do. Exactly. You, know, <laughs> yeah. you throw it straight back at them, reflect yeah, it. Yeah, reflect it back at them. And, it, it, what, and their objection probably isn't valid anyway, because 90% no, of them don't even know what multi-level marketing almost is. Almost never, yeah. ever. Unless you've got someone who's already in another company of yeah. some sort. And even then, large numbers of them have absolutely no idea what they're doing. Yeah. They just, they got, bam they got, they bought the opportunity meeting. <laughs> and the promise of, mi of a million pounds a year by the end of next week. You know, that, mm -hmm. that's what's happened. And, and many of them go in with their eyes shut, even though they think they're open. And that's, and that's probably the biggest objection is that people have said you're going to make loads of money in loads, you know, it, it's going to be so simple. It's sort of, it's, nothing's simple. Yeah, the it's con simple, the it's not easy. Is simple. Yeah. The concept is simple. The concept, the, 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 the task isn't easy always. And you know, and you said, uh, um, Nigel said earlier, we haven't progressed as far as we have wanted yet. And you know what? It's bloody frustrating when you see people going past you. And, yeah. and I, I don't have an issue with that because they're yes, in my do. team. Yes, you do. <laughs> I, do. You do. I do have an issue with it, but they're in my team, so that's fine. But the, the, the thing for me was like, <laughs> what am I doing that's not attractive? What, how, you know, looking Listen. at myself and seeing what's happening. And I know it's a numbers game. Please, uh, you know, it. I have to put up with the tantrums, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually truly, I actually truly, truly believe that it is such fun when, when I find someone who doesn't want to do it and it is, I ask them all these questions because. There's always a possibility for me to practice whatever skills I've got. And it's so much fun trying to turn them around. Exactly. Because they don't have an answer. Yeah. And when they say, well, okay, then give me the something I give them. You never hear from, from them at all, but that's okay. I, I just love getting them but you to think. Think. like sport. You know, yeah. It's yeah. a game to you. Yeah. And, and that's, just that, that's where a lot, I think the vast majority <laughs> of people don't, don't think of it in that way. It is. It's, it's is, all yeah. a bit too. You know, I think we're all guilty of it to some extent. I make it. I like to be structured about what I do. I like to. I like to follow a, a process because it works for me. Um, and I, I and, I, and I can do. I've done it so often, so much that I can freeform it almost off the top of my head now. But I don't generally do that. I always plan what I'm going to say because it works for me. Now, what you do works for you. And, mm. and I think a lot of us could learn a lot from that attitude in particular. Well, let's just treat it like sport because that's what it is. You know, it's just fun. Just talking. Yeah, I, I had, with meeting new people. I had a conversation with a practitioner the other day and I couldn't find a number for her. I couldn't find any number anywhere. Oh my God, this is. But on her website was make an appointment. Okay. So I made an appointment. <laughs> <laughs> this is hilarious. She wasn't overly happy. <laughs> <laughs> you know what and I went um, I said well I did try to get hold of your number a different way but I said you're rather difficult to get hold of and so she said well this is for this is for patients and I said I appreciate that and I said should we end the conversation here now well what did you want to talk to me about well I, I didn't think you were interested in what so I, I just started thinking having some fun with it and so I said, you know, as a practitioner, do you, you know, kind of what do you do? Do you have any test spacing case nutrition? Well, I get all mine from food. And I said, well, okay, so how do you know that food's working on a cellular level? And, and then started pulling it. So, well, she said, send me some information. And there I said, go. what would be your best email? She said, look on my website. And I thought, oh, <laughs> so I haven't sent it to her yet. And I thought, She's, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait not, for a bit. She's not going to phone you and ask you where it is. No, no, she isn't. But I just, <laughs> no. oh my God, you know, so many people are up their own backsides. And, you know, we have got something that they all need. And mm. looking at this, looking at her, I knew she'd be well out of balance. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you can judge that. <laughs> oh, I can spot him a mile off. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm not I'm not a betting man, but 97 to 1 is pretty decent. Odds, yeah, it is actually. Know, at the end of the day, yeah. 97 yeah. out of 100 people are going to be out. Uh, um, <laughs> so it, it's a fair it's a fair guess they're going to be out. Um, Dermot, perhaps you would just share for us 
uh, Dr. Galacha's results and how long it took. You're muted, by the way. How long it took to get him to bloody do it. Unmute, unmute, unmute yourself, Dermot. Dermot. Unmute yourself. You're muted. Unmute yourself, Dermot. Hang on. Let's see if I can do it. No, you can't. <laughs> Dermot, unmute Possible yourself. Three. Okay. It took okay. About three. a year and a half before. So we he... him just before we left Spain. Yes. So that's September. We left in September. The year before last. Yeah. The year before last. Yeah, about 18 months. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he wouldn't, and I'm, I, I took a test along. He did the first test that got lost in the post. Well, we got it in the end after three months. Yeah. Uh, but he thought he was going to be <laughs> very good, but he wasn't. He was 33 to one. Well, wow. this is the doc. This is his doctor. This is his doctor. And he's a really lovely guy. I hope he comes on. Yeah, anyway, oh, I do too. All good. Any other questions before we wrap up? No, not from me. Okay. Um, no. I will. Uh, I've got your email address, Stuart. Have we got every, we've got everybody else. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I'm gonna, I'll send you this back up. Well, I haven't got Joe. I don't know who Joe is. Hi, Joe. Yeah, Joe me. is my, my uh, colleague. Okay. Um, so you, I, I pass it to you. You can, you can just give her a copy of it. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll send I'll send you the document, and uh, I will uh, I'll write that uh, conversation tree up for you, Carolyn, so that. Yes, thank you, because you know, I think that would be really, yeah. really good, really uh, useful. Yeah, you're you're thank welcome. You. I'll do that for everyone as well as, but I'll send you this because yeah. it's prepared. Don't, don't have an open edge. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. All good, guys. Thank you. Um, Sabine, um, we'll we'll have a conversation shortly. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Bye, yeah. All right then. Bye. 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 Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye, Bye guys.